morning to you as well. Leanne, thank you very much indeed, and a very warm welcome to uh, Cape Town this morning. We're at the uh, Cape Town International Convention Centre, and this is the scene for the latest in the series of New Age Business Briefings, brought to you by the SABC, and today kindly sponsored by Transnet. And uh, we're talking about a sphere of government that uh, affects every single one of us right across uh, our nine provinces, and that's local government. Uh, for the past uh, few days, the South African Local Government Association has been meeting and uh, under the auspices of their uh, National Members' Assembly. But at the back of that, they've been also tackling the uh, thorny issue of corruption. And uh, we'll be discussing that, some of the successes that they've had uh, in the past 20 years uh, as we look into the next decades, I guess, uh, and also the challenges, because you would know in the areas that uh, you live uh, what the issues are, what the challenges are, and uh, we invite you to be part of this conversation and put your questions through uh, to the gentlemen that uh, are joining me on stage now as I introduce them. Let's begin with the Salga chairperson himself, Councillor Tabo Magnoni. Thank you very much indeed for joining Thank us. Very much. Uh, he also wears the hat of uh, the executive mayor of the municipality of Mangaung, but today he's the Salga chairperson. Uh, thank you for your time. And uh, next to you is Mr. Kolile George, who's the uh, CEO of uh, Salga. Thank you very much indeed for joining us and welcome to the program. All right, gentlemen, let's get straight into it. A lot to discuss, a lot of issues, and uh, South Africa is watching, so you're basically facing the people today. Uh, let's start with what happened this week. Um, Mr. Chairperson, uh, Councillor Magnoni, maybe share your thoughts with us. What's happened over the last couple of days? Uh, what should we take cognizance of? Yes, um, we started, of course, with uh, the summit. Everybody's talking about it. Mm -hmm. uh, Anti-corruption, uh, anti-maladministration summit. And yesterday also we celebrated some achievements. We were uh, launching what we call Masondo Achievement, uh, recognizing what uh, Obama Masondo has done in this country, particularly when he was the mayor. And so we to the tearing all the streets and so forth. So we basically are saying there are problems, like on matters of corruption, which we have to deal with, but also there are successes like we were celebrating uh, the Masondo uh, achievement. Let me start with the issue of corruption. Though, yes, it is true that government has done much on fighting corruption, but what we intend doing as local government is to put this on the agenda so that society can start talking about it. Because if you hide it, you look away, then it thrives. And uh, we've been saying it is a societal problem. It is not necessarily a local government problem. Take, for instance, now, we are celebrating Madiba, the long walk to freedom, but already there are DVDs out there on the street, black market, that we are buying, and basically we think it is proper. And that is not proper, that is corruption. And in a society where you get high tolerance of corruption, it becomes then easy for institutions also to be corrupt. Because these institutions are a micro of a bigger uh, picture. So as South Africans, we all must say no to corruption. And in this regard, local government is taking a higher step, putting this on the agenda and say, let us deal with it in our own institutions. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mr. George, I think uh, very briefly, if you can, uh, people at home uh, are going to hear this acronym SALGA, uh, which uh, stands for the South African Local Government Association quite a bit. Maybe just give us a little bit of background. What is SALGA and why should they care actually that it exists? How does it affect their lives at home? Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Good morning to all the Morning Life listeners and viewers at home. SALGA is a constitutional body. It's an organization that represents all municipalities in South Africa. And its mandate, if I can summarize it, is to be an ambassador for local government, to make sure that uh, we represent and articulate the interests of local government in our intergovernmental system. We have in our country uh, three spheres, the national, 
provincial and local government. And local government is the most expansive sphere. So in the engagement in the IGR system, Salga acts as an ambassador in terms of ensuring that when laws and policies are passed in parliament, they find expression in local government. So Salga acts as that ambassador to make sure that we have laws, we have policies, that when they are implemented by our municipalities, they broadly reflect uh, the capabilities of local government. They take into account interests that will enable local government to do that. We similarly, in the national uh, executive of the republic, uh, represents interests of local government. And we are also the employer body, meaning that uh, on behalf of all municipalities, Salga acts as the employer in terms of collective bargaining and also ensuring that the leadership in local government, both administratively and politically, receives much needed capacity building support to discharge its mandate and responsibilities. That's the core trust of Salga. The last part being the role of Salga to profile local government locally and internationally in terms of good practices that local government stands for and also profile the good work that arises out of leadership of local government. Okay, all right. So it sounds like a great institution. Uh, maybe it's just a club, though, because, you know, I woke up this morning and it was quite shocking to see this headline here. Cape Town braces for marches, and they're dubbing it the mother of all marches. Residents demands housing, toilets, electricity, clean water, kids' recreational facilities. Um, Mr. Chairperson, I put it to you, 20 years on, as much as you've made progress, you just haven't done enough. Yes, um, we must accept that we have lots of backlogs. There are lots of issues that we have to deal with as local government and as government in general. Ours is, we are delivering, as the editor indicated earlier, but the issue is we are not delivering enough and fast enough. Why? Because obviously, in any world, in any country, you can't have all the resources to solve all problems. Uh, if that was possible, we would all be happy. We wouldn't be having those matches. But, Terence but uh, the issue here is... Um, but Terence Nombembe reckons that there's billions that have been wasted. So you've got money and resources, but something is going wrong. What is it? No, no. What basically is happening in this regard is that we have systems in this country. You might as have as much money as possible, but you have to stick to the rules and the systems. And sometimes you've got rules and systems that are making it difficult to deliver as fast as you would want. So there are those issues that we are dealing with, as Salga with uh, central government, the regulatory uh, framework that makes it that hampers uh, service delivery is what we also are addressing. But the fact of the matter is, we would not be able really to deal with the legacy of apartheid within a very short period of time. Mm. That's the reality. Um, Mr. George, what is Salga doing? Because I know one of the pillars of your functions is to build capacity. Uh, what are you doing to build that capacity so that we don't have this scenario where uh, <laughs> government writes a policy or some of the policies are inconsistent with the actual needs on the ground, uh, the legislative environment uh, that uh, uh, Mr. Manyoni is talking about. What is Salga as an organization doing to solve this? Well, the, the challenge of capacity building uh, is quite vast. And one of the issues that was uh, recognized much earlier in the Constitution of the Republic is that uh, in the matrix of responsibilities between national, provincial, and local government, inherently, there has to be interdependence in the roles and responsibilities of these three spheres of government. So it was much envisaged that the local government sphere, as it evolves, there will be a need for ensuring that it has got a requisite capacity and expertise to do that. So both national and provincial government were then charged with the responsibility to provide support to the sphere of local government. So at the level of Salga, our translation of that takes into account two obligations. One, 
to build the institution of local government itself as a municipality, to make sure that systems, norms, and standards at the level of the municipality are quite coherent across the sector, to make sure that we've got resilience in our institutions, to implement programs in a manner that can be measured right across the board. So the institutional resilience uh, is one of those elements. The second part is about leadership itself. Uh, leadership at the level of political and administratively. So what SALGA does in every year, starting from the transition, we have a five-year political transition in our country, national, provincial, and local. So what we do as SALGA, we then prepare the new leadership of local government as it joins the sector. Mm -hmm. What we normally do is to run orientation program, induction program. And uh, we're proud, uh, Peter, that in 2011, post-18 May, we have covered almost 98% of our councillors in terms of them being prepared to appreciate the complexity and the scale yeah. of responsibilities that they'll Are be confronted. Are you getting the right people, though? Because, you know, you can have the best programs in the world, the, the best support in the world, but if you've got the wrong people sitting in those jobs as your municipal managers, your... Uh, people actually running the municipalities, if you've got the wrong people there, then you'll continue to have these issues, even though the structures might have been set up properly. Um, here, when we talk about people, we are obviously looking into two levels, the political level and also the admin level. The right people, it's about the right leadership that has to lead the institution. In other words, committed politicians, mm. people who basically can touch the community. You know, people who have the feeling of those who are less fortunate than us. I think that if you get that right, it then becomes easy for administration to perform. That's what we are saying. That's our view as Salga. In administration, yes, there are areas, particularly your smaller municipalities, who can't afford some of the skills. And uh, what we are saying is, Salga, is look, if you, you are able to get a hospital in a rural area, but then be able to employ qualified medical doctors, we should do the same with smaller municipalities because we want to provide the same service for South Africans, wherever they are. And that's our argument. And that's where basically, at the moment, George um, and the officials in government are looking into this matter. The issue of skilled personnel in municipalities, it is still a very big problem. With all due respect though, you know, we've had these conversations mm. over and over and over again. There was, uh, the municipal turnaround strategy, there was all sorts of documents and periodically there's a new leadership that comes in. Now you've got the strategic plan 2012 to 2017. People at home saying, yeah, you say the right things, but we're not feeling it. That's why we are marching with our feet. Um, what's going to be different now? You guys are in charge. Uh, you're the new leadership. What's going to be different now? Are you going to take it? Well, in, in, <laughs> in, 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 in terms of local government, Peter, uh, we have a story of progress in our country. A story of steady progress in terms of ensuring that uh, one of the primary focus in 1994 was about the extent to which South Africa should confront the legacy of the past. A number of our people have no access to water, sanitation, electricity, roads, and they uh, are afflicted by a high level of poverty. And local government has a positive story in the fact that it has contributed significantly. And one of the greatest achievements that we think as a sector uh, we claim so proudly is the extent to which census results of 2011 uh, confirmed the extent to which local government has contributed to the acceleration of basic services. Everybody knows the, I don't want to flash the statistics around it, but uh, the extent to which we have pushed redistributive programs of water, sanitation, electricity, and roads. 
And we think that come 2012, seven core goal areas of SALGA. The first one being the acceleration of basic services. A number of our communities do receive these services, but the point is made, there's a growing level of impatience. And we're looking at jacking up systems at local government to make sure that the capacity individually, as you point out, getting wrong people in municipalities and so on. We now have uh, entry minimum standards that we have championed working closely mm -hmm. with the National Treasury and also the National Department of Cooperative Governance to make sure that amongst key skills that are critical for human services, financial management, technical skills and so on, we are able across the board to regulate entry to the sector, something that we did not have before. And we welcome that. We think that it will go a long way in stabilizing the sector in terms of ensuring that across the board we've got good skills in place. We have also looked at um, the challenge of leadership in terms of oversight. Because sometimes you get the resources. Money is at the end of the financial year gets sent back to the National Treasure. Why? One could cite skills, as you say. The second part, inability of institutions to monitor themselves. And we have said as Salga, there's a need for us to be much more creative, to look at a similar model mm. to national legislature and provincial legislature, to introduce oversight mechanism that will be fairly robust. The municipal public accounts committees, the audit committees, mm. and we're proud as Salga to say that over the last 2011, 2012, across the board, we have established 98% of the structures, capacitated them, and we think that steadily we would realize as a country a robust infrastructure of ensuring that funds don't go back. We will point out and also hold accountable officials that do wrong in local government. All right, let, let's talk about that because I think this is a big issue. People have got this perception that people can act with impunity, uh, that people are not being nailed to their crosses when they do wrong. Um, how can we be confident that you're going to do this? Uh, you've just come out of this corruption summit. What is going to change now? Um, because if you don't change it, uh, you know, the statistics are saying we have a march almost every second day. I mean, that's how bad it is. You're saying we're making progress, but the people on the ground are saying you're not. Um, and that all they see is this corruption, inverted commas. So the question is, out of these two days, how are we going to stop it? Wh what are you going to do to make sure that people do get nailed uh, for what they do? Um, the starting point is to put measures so that you prevent, you don't cure. What we are looking into uh, within these few days is to have a municipal matrix which will be used as a sort of a barometer where we would say this municipality, it doesn't have the following systems. It doesn't have the necessary required leadership. And therefore, it is a high risk municipality where you can find uh, corruption or where corruption can thrive. So that we then benchmark with other municipalities and say this municipality is almost corrupt free in the sense that it is having the necessary um, measures mm -hmm. put in place. That's what we will be uh, working on, to make sure that we prevent, as I'm saying. The other thing is strengthening also our oversight committees uh, to make sure that the municipality can function uh, quite well. But as I'm indicating, the problem also is a societal problem, where you allow people to buy stolen goods it then becomes easy also for corruption to strive in municipalities. I think that we have to deal with as a society. Yep. It is not about an institution. It is about the whole, let's say, the municipality in the sense of yep. the city. But again, it's down. You said it yourself yep. at a media briefing earlier this week. It, it's the leadership. Now, and I keep coming back to getting the right people. You've also hinted political element to this. Uh, is, is deployees part of the problem? In a way, it depends. Obviously, you can't say all deployees are a problem. I may deploy myself and I'm a proud deployee for that matter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Yes, we are sending a clear message to all political parties to say, please, if you say local government is a very important sphere of government, make sure that you take care of it in the sense of giving that sphere of government right people to lead it. I was making the mm -hmm. example of Obama Masson, that's why. Abu Pascal and so on, we have been there. And I think uh, they tried their best given the conditions mm -hmm. that they were operating mm -hmm. in. So we need to always to also, as Salga, lobby for better performance in that uh, regard. And yes, we are saying people are more important even than systems. Because if you've got the right people with the right attitude, then we will mm -hmm. make this industry uh, work. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, George has indicated earlier that um, there are measures that we have put in place. You were asking, what will be the difference? Mm -hmm. You had turnaround strategy, come with all these strategies, plans, mm -hmm. but it seems as if nothing is, uh, mm -hmm. is working. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, it is work in progress. Things are happening. It is just that they are not happening for all at the same time. Why? And I think that's where the issues basically are. Why isn't it happening for all? Just because municipalities are all not necessarily equal in terms of skills that we, we earlier talked about. Whose fault is that? Of course. The issue is, this is the reality of South Africa that we are faced with. No, but whose and fault is that? No, no. The fault <laughs> is not necessarily about whose fault it is. But it must be. Somebody <laughs> must be to blame if we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. No, mm. no. Here we are talking about putting the necessary systems and getting the right people in place. 20 years later. 20 years later, the issue is, are we having right people in this country that we can deploy? Are we having the right accountants and oversupply of these people? Can we afford them as municipalities? I made an example about a rural municipality mm -hmm. out there that might not be able to get engineers to get accountants, and we expect this municipality mm. to provide a service. So okay. that's the reality. And this is what basically we need to look into as a country and see how basically can we help those municipalities also to provide a service like our big metros are doing. All right, we're gonna take a quick commercial break. When we come back, we're going to start taking your questions from the floor and also questions from you at home. Don't forget the uh, address is hashtag TNA Biz Brief at Morning Live SABC. We'd love to hear what your thoughts are, what's going on in your municipality, in your metro, in your district council that uh, you want to bring to the attention of uh, the uh, esteemed gentleman that we have here who's sitting at the top of the tree and we'll get some commitments uh, for you uh, this morning. So stay with us and we'll see you right after this. I didn't expect to die so soon. The reality is, I didn't look out for my family first. No one can say, buying life insurance was a priority for me. It can't be said, my family will be financially protected. But the truth is, I haven't died yet. My family will be financially protected. It can be said, buying life insurance was a priority for me. No one can say, I didn't look out for my family first. The reality is, I chose clientele life. There is more than one way to say I love you. Premium life cover from clientele is your legacy of love. It's available from 200 Rand per month and pays up to 10 million Rand. No medical examinations, no hidden fees, and you receive cash back. Simply SMS LIFE to 47516 and we'll call you back. SMS now. 
SABC News plays a critical role in providing unbiased and reliable news. We have a well-established reputation of uncovering, reporting and delivering news. A significant growth in popularity of our news demonstrates the demand for our news content. We continue to provide unrivaled coverage of vital events in and out of the country. Wherever the news is happening, we'll be there to bring them to you at the right time. No one has the news covered like SABC News. We lead and they follow. SABC News, Africa's news leader. Good evening and welcome to Kaleidoscope, the show that brings you the very best of Africa to the world. Just a few kilometers away from the hustle and bustle of the city is an animal sanctuary known as the Lion Park. Our great team went to go check out and see if the lion is still singing tonight. Among all of the cat's family, cheetahs are the most easiest to train or to tame. A youth leader in South Africa said if white people don't like it, that the youth are going to lead South Africa, they can adapt or fly. And I said, thank you for the title. So again, I thank politicians for my title. <laughs> That's Kaleidoscope, Sundays, 5.30 p.m. on SABC News. Right, a very warm welcome back. And uh, today we're talking local government, your municipality, your district council, your metro. Are they doing the job? They've been telling us that they are. They're saying that they've made huge progress but the service deliveries perhaps might, the marches and protests perhaps might be painting a different picture. Is it just impatience or perhaps not really seeing what's going on? Well, let's start hearing from you at home and also uh, from our audience that are here at the Cape Town International Convention Center. And uh, let's start uh, with uh, Zama, uh, is that Kampi? Uh, Zama, what table are you? All right. Uh, if we can have the lights up so we can oh. see Zama, please. Oh, I thought he was saying Zama. All right, can we get a microphone to Zama that's, that's, that, that's working? He's got an issue about youth employment. <coughs> yeah, thanks Zama. Most of the youth centers in the municipalities are not effective as we want. Um, possibly, I think it's due to revenue collections. It has been announced this on the State of the Nation address, remember. But my question is, can we possibly turn these youth centers in most of the municipalities to be job creation and skills development centers? Thank you. All right, just before you sit down, what is the critical difference that you want in, in changing their designation? You see, most of young people, they don't know where to get information possible about what the municipalities are doing. So, uh, and we've got youth centers in most of the municipalities. So my question is, how can we turn the youth centers which are there, and then it becomes the feeder to the young people about the information which uh, the municipalities are giving? Okay, gentlemen. Thank you. Pardon. Yeah. What we are supposing as Salga is that citizens should uh, own municipalities. That's why we are talking about inclusive cities, where we feel that we are part of these municipalities. So um, when it comes to this question, it basically means it is young people who also must be creative enough and say we need to use this institution for a particular benefit. We need to have a desk as young people there, where we can get information and so forth. The municipalities, obviously, they have the capacity, they have the resources to assist in that regard. The problem with us, and I think it's a general problem in South Africa, is that we don't communicate to each other. We talk across each other, and that basically creates a problem. I wanted to highlight something before you, uh, you took the questions. Mm. That are you aware, Peter, that uh, like in any other country, in South Africa, we are chasing the ball that is always moving. As municipalities, today the community would say, we want to have a school. And when we are busy building a school, tomorrow they say, we want a hospital. So <laughs> you can't basically say nothing is happening. Mm -hmm. The issue is at that time, there is a particular demand. Mm -hmm. And these demands, they come on rolling. And you also mm -hmm. have to keep pace. And that's exactly where you find the problem. And that's a great argument if 
billions are not being misspent, misused, yes. and <coughs> we're having all this inefficiency, uh, then that argument can stand up. But for as long as you have that gap, it's a difficult argument to convince yes. people. Of. But Peter, you talk as if there is generally inefficiency, there is nothing that is being done, and hence people are always angry. But Mr. Auditor General <laughs> hasn't given you a great scorecard. No, no. The Auditor General doesn't necessarily say there is no service delivery. The Auditor General is saying there are systems that are not in place in some of the municipalities, mm. although obviously there are pockets of achievement. I think that's a different okay. story uh, in this regard. All right. Let's go to Table 11. Uh, Bushimani Jonas. Table 11. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Um, um, I, I, I think one must acknowledge that people have the right to protest, to demonstrate, as a way of expressing their discontent and dissatisfaction. I just wanted to check uh, the systems that we have in place when this turns violent and destructive, because that is what is uh, part of our, our problem. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, um, I was at a risk management conference this last week, and I was quite surprised to note that we're not the worst in terms of protests mm -hmm. in, and strikes in the world, that there are other countries that have strikes and so on and so forth, but ours are violent. And I was just wondering, what is it about our culture or the way we do things? How can we change this? Uh, so that we don't have this concern that uh, our, our person has. Peter, what I personally am stressing, like in my municipality, is that before there's a protest, we need to engage. We are South, African, we, South Africans, we need to talk to each other. There's just a tendency that, yes, we will protest, we will not want to engage, mm -hmm. and that's where you get a problem. And worst of all, even if these strikes get violent, you can't explain why should somebody go and burn a library, mm. the future of your children and other people's children. But these are things that are happening. But is why? it really because you want service delivery, or is it because you also want to make sure that there is no delivery at all? So there are other issues that I think as a society we also need to deal with as South Africans. Because so most of the time... Are you suggesting that some people are, je are purposefully not listening because they want certain municipalities run by certain parties to fail? Absolutely. You will find that in most cases, some of these protests, and particularly violent protests, they are also politically motivated. So there are politics that are playing a role out mm -hmm. there. But I can't basically say that's uh, general. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, we need also to question the nature of our mm -hmm. actions as much as we are requesting or wanting to have service delivered. So what do we do in a situation where your own party is fighting against each other? That will need uh, political parties to answer. Oh. <laughs> 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 okay, table 23, Zamukolo Peter. Thanks, thanks, Bida. Yes. Thanks very much, Peter, and Chairperson and the CEO. Firstly, let me appreciate all good work done by our government and the support we get from SALCO. But my question, Peter, is the fact that we have not done enough. <clears throat> For instance, Gramstown is one of the oldest uh, town, 200 years in the country and and we've inherited the old infrastructure so you've got a ser serious problem of the aging infrastructure and my question is what is it that we are doing to address that challenge so um, I'm appealing that a particular focus must be paid in addressing the aging infrastructure and of course developing the rural areas. Thanks very much, Peter. Mm -hmm. 
different. Yeah, the rural areas is a, a particular problem, isn't it? Uh, and I'll put this to you, Mr. George, because they, A, they don't have the population base to create the tax and the revenue streams that are required to develop. How do we fix that? Um, and this pretty much, <laughs> it'll continue as a problem unless we come up with a, a, a bigger solution. Peter, I made a point earlier on about uh, the policy trust of our democratic dispensation. Policy choices that were made to say we need to embark on a, a redistributive policy direction as a country. When we consolidated municipalities, there were areas similar to Grahamstown that they were historically servicing a few population in our country and largely across racial lines. And in a redistributive model of uh, creating what we today call wall-to-wall -wall municipalities, it meant, therefore, that areas that were hitherto excluded from that services needs to be connected to services. So an expansive policy mechanism to put services, water, electricity to other areas meant in that policy choice, invariable, we neglected maintenance in those areas as we extend to others. Now, it's catching up with us, um, but as it is catching up with us, we are equally proud that areas that could not have services now have areas. If you go to Grahamstown, uh, within townships, and areas outside there, people receive services and so on. But I think the city is buckling under the pressure of poor bulk infrastructure that could not be expanded to connect uh, 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 in a way the rest of the uh, uh, area. So I'm aware about Grahamstown's situation. And uh, as we all know nationally, there is now what we call National Infrastructure Development Plan. So specific areas are being targeted in terms of the rollout of a uh, building resilient public uh, bulk infrastructure. And I think Dwarf is working closely on the issue of Grahamstown to deal with that. Well, sustainability is another big thing when you talk about rolling out these infrastructures. Mm. Uh, again, I keep asking, what's going to be different? It's great to roll out things, mm. but maintenance has been one of the weaknesses that we've had. Uh, mm. Johannesburg, as soon as it rains, I know there are a certain number of traffic lights that are just not going to work, and they may take days. We even have now pointsmen, almost like an industry that's built up. That shouldn't be happening, surely, in a world-class city. Well, when you look at the, the budget mechanisms that municipalities, uh, like the rest of national government, we were budgeting less than 9% for maintenance. And we now have a program called uh, ADAM, it's accelerated uh, infrastructure maintenance program that is implemented by the energy ministry in terms of electricity as part of the redistribution uh, review of uh, electricity. And part of the budget approval process requires that municipal must set aside a certain amount for maintenance. We think it goes a long way in terms of uh, ensuring that uh, we are able to have sufficient uh, basis to maintain infrastructure. We also have a number of grants that municipalities are performing very well. Areas like MIG funding, which also Grahamstown uh, uh, could benefit uh, around the MIG funding. We also have uh, grants like uh, a DUSG, uh, Development Urban Settlement Grant, that is also targeting and ensuring that we provide services uh, to communities that could not be served. So there's a variety of measures in which municipalities are expanding provision of services. But uh, we are confident that in our engagement with the Financial and Fiscal Commission, the provision of set-aside for maintenance grant will go a long way in dealing with that aspect. All right, so, okay, we're going to take another quick break, and it is a very quick one. When we come back, uh, I'm curious to know what you're thinking at home. Let's see if we can pick up some of your tweets. And then our next person here is going to be Zakele Zulu, uh, who will be talking to us from table number six. And uh, they're concerned about the professionalization of local government. All of that still to come. Stay with us.
Hi, it's a very warm welcome back to you. Uh, we're talking local government uh, here at the Cape Town International Convention Center. Uh, this has been a week for the South African Local Government Association, and they've been tackling issues uh, about municipalities as well as corruption. And uh, we want to know what you're thinking at home and also our audience here. Zakele Zulu is on table number six, and I wonder what you have to say. Table number six, Zakele. Uh, thank you. Mine is the issue of professionalization of local government uh, in a sense that uh, you have been referring to skills uh, shortages. And I, I believe that uh, sometimes uh, it's not an issue of skills shortages, but sometimes it's the sabotage of uh, officials uh, in regard to uh, municipal managers not seeing eye to eye with the mayor and then there's a, a, a sabotage in service delivery that affects the community. But my take is to say, what is the SALCA's uh, role in ensuring that such conflict between the, the officials and politicians does not affect the service delivery in the communities? Thank you. Okay, very good question. Okay. And we're seeing that playing out quite a bit well, I'm glad, I'm glad about that question, Peter. Uh, Salga, on the 7th of uh, March this year, launched what is called National Human Resource Development Strategy. And its core trust is on uh, looking at mechanisms, uh, systems, and norms that must be implemented across local government to make sure that uh, we have seamlessness. Mm -hmm. Now, that speaks directly to the need for us to have professional ethos in local government that responds directly to the values and visage in our constitution, section 195, to build a capable, a developmentally oriented local government. And as we speak as SALGA, we're looking at a, a system investment in local government so that uh, we can be able to pick up one, skills capabilities that exist in local government, mobility of staff, and also making sure that uh, we uh, plant a seed of responsiveness by officials in local government. It's true. Mm -hmm. You will have instances where officials are not doing uh, their job. There is no better interface between the political and administrative areas. Somebody gets uh, charged in municipality one, gets disciplined successfully, and then he reemerges somewhere. And that municipality, the receiving one, has no clue that person has a bad record elsewhere. So some of the investments we're putting up in place is to make sure that we would also disbar people uh, who don't act in a manner that carries the integrity and values that we all aspire to have in local government. You, you, you don't work in Mangawung and next time you wake up in Johannesburg or you wake up in the national department. So the, 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 the new public administration bill that the, the Ministry of uh, Public Administration is now championing mm would speak also direct to creating seamlessness across the spheres right. of government around uh, professionalism. That's dealing with people that uh, have been successfully disciplined. But what do you do about this infighting? Um, Councillor uh, Manyoni, we've got <laughs> Nombu, uh, is it Lucky Lubisi who says, uh, Peter, the problem with our municipalities is that they hire people just because they've got ANC membership and not because they're qualified. And for as long as that perception is out there and that reality is out there, you'll have a few disciplinary things. Yes, you'll manage that with this new bill. But this infighting, if, it, if it's got a political origination, how are you going to manage that? Peter, let's start with uh, the issue of hiring people because they are ANC members. Um, Behind that statement, it is, if you are ANC, you are not qualified. Uh, or and I think people who are making these statements are very <laughs> reckless. <laughs> no. Those are very reckless yeah. uh, statements where you measure the qualifications in terms of party affiliation. And I think basically we are losing the point. But let's come to the issue of um, um, mayors and officials and so forth. I normally describe a mayor as um, a person who is at a perennial war with uh, the city manager. And I think it is healthy 
because we are not body bodies there. We are under pressure as politicians. We can feel the pressure and we want to see things happening as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. Even this discussion, as we can hear, you are asking, are you doing enough? That's what the communities are saying. So sometimes because of the nature of the industry, you then get those type of uh, tensions. I don't think they are just, you know, uh, happening because mayors like to fight city managers and so forth. But it's because of the nature of the industry where people are under pressure and are supposed mm -hmm. to be seen to be doing something about uh, some of the okay. service delivery uh, demands. All right, I'm going to hurry us along because I want to get through as many of these as possible. Kondile uh, Maloni, Table 30. Uh, mm -hmm. Table 30, Kondile uh, Maloni. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, mine is, uh, is brief, uh, Chair. In light of national treasury competencies, requirements, what the role SALCA uh, is playing in ensuring that uh, skilled people are employed uh, before the cutoff date, which is June 2014. I've noted earlier on, uh, Peter, that uh, Mr. George has indicated that uh, there's entry minimum standards. Uh, which has been agreed upon together with COCTA uh, to say at least these senior managers that we are employing must have these uh, minimum standards. Uh, I, just, I was raising that, uh, Peter, uh, in light of the fact that 2014 is also the year of clean audit. Uh, I just wanted to, 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 to get some answers around that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Peter. The requirements of minimum standards are twofold. One, regulating entry into the sector, that uh, as people have a composite set of skills that they acquire, uh, your bachelor or diploma, whatever it is in higher uh, education, becomes the core. The second aspect is the exposure to local government, because we are quite a unique uh, uh, operations um, um, uh, center as local government compared to others. So we appreciate that people need to have this. We are given 18 months within which to acquire those. However, we also acknowledge that we have people in local government already who have the requisite experience that they have acquired. But through internal mobility in a municipal, I might have started uh, as an admin assistant somewhere in, in the police department. And now I'm working in the supply chain. So what these minimum standards require is that as you enter in that responsibility, you're going to now be managing supply chain or finance, the municipal is under obligation to expose you to also acquire those qualifications. So it looks at that particular area, and we have made representation as Salga to say to National Treasure, these must not be blanket requirements. They must appreciate uh, acquired experience. At the same time, they must be mm. developmental in nature, support existing initiatives in municipalities. Okay. And I think uh, we will be vigilant in ensuring that. All right, well, we're still talking about jobs and Devour Mashamba writes, uh, can you ask them about job creation because I'm working as a casual four to five years under the city of Johannesburg libraries. They only give their family uh, permanent jobs. How is it that somebody can be a casual for four and a half years? Councillor? Of course, I would not know much about this particular um, But it might case. be happening across... Yes, and about the families that uh, have been employed uh, by who and so forth. So I think it's a case that needs to be properly uh, Is this reported. unusual? Mm, For me, it's totally is it unusual. unusual. So I wish I could uh, employ okay. my family in my <laughs> municipality. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, yes, there are... I'm not sure about the casualty issue, mm -hmm. because then labor is supposed to do its uh, job. We have full-time shop stewards in councils mm -hmm. who are supposed to be dealing with these matters. And I would rather really we utilize our own uh, mechanisms in these institutions. Okay. Because if we don't, then we end up having this type of cases. All right. Table 29, Luleka, is it Ndebele? Or Nzele, can't quite read your writing. Uh, table 29, uh, Luleg, where are you? If you could just say your name as well. Please uh, give her a microphone. Uh, 
Thank you very much. My name is Lurega Simon. Okay. The question goes to the Salga leadership on the outcome of the demarcation of municipality. That will have a serious impact in the smaller municipalities, particularly the issue of population. And what is your view as Salga on this matter? I want to make an example of Amashati municipality, Great Kai municipality, Moshua municipality. And it will have an impact as well in the district municipality of Yamatoli. And those municipalities are rural municipality. Plus minus 22 villages are going to Buffalo City. Are we not creating an indigent municipalities? Okay, so self-infliction of pain. <laughs> well, I think we must all appreciate the objective of demarcation. When we look at the, the objects around uh, um, uh, it's, uh, the, the, the chapter that deals with uh, uh, demarcation, it's called Section 4, it looks at a number of factors that municipalities uh, are required uh, to comply with as the demarcation board evaluates these matters. So part of uh, bringing on board into a metropolitan municipality is the consideration that we need to create a, a space for communities to be integrated within municipalities that are relatively capacitated. But what we're advancing as Salga, much as we support uh, reintegration of certain municipalities or certain parts in certain areas, is that our municipalities must uh, be enabled to function in a manner that doesn't undermine fiscal or financial sustainability of the municipality. And uh, we have taken a view as Salga that learning from the city of Tswan, integration of uh, Bronco Sprite and other areas, that brought into the municipality a huge hole, one billion rand additional resources. And at that time, there was not even an investment to say, how do we interpret the impact of this? So as Salga, we have now worked out a mechanism, a guideline that uh, working closely with the demarcation board and working closely with those receiving municipalities, they will be able to make representation so that there's a transitional support grant. You now have a situation in Gauteng, um, uh, M. Fuleni, uh, Citibank, and uh, Midval, big integrated. So the Salga guideline on what it means to reintegrate communities uh, is central to ensuring that we don't undermine the fiscal sustainability of municipality. And I think with regard to Buffalo City, those areas coming from Nushua, coming from uh, Stutterheim, Amasati, and so on, we would make sure as Salga that we support the municipality as a fledging metro to make sure that it's not settled with a burden of uh, fiscal responsibility as it expands services to those areas. But yes, there is a need for us to make sure that where it's better serviced, such communities uh, must be integrated around those. Do the demarquees have a say in whether they are moved from one jurisdiction to another? Do, can they object? Yes, and are the, you listening to them? The demarcation board is compelled to have community inputs before it can decide. So obviously, um, you will never have communities speaking one voice in most cases. So, you so they will be those who are not happy. Okay. And uh, the chairperson of the- chairman is here. The All right, well, let's hear from here. the chairperson. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the chairperson? <laughs> All right, please, if you could just, just address that, because it is a quite a contentious issue. And, and, and some people would even say that there's a political overtone to this demarcation where you want to make sure you've got the right number of voters to vote for a certain party in a certain jurisdiction in a certain area. <laughs> if you could just tell the viewers your name as well. No thanks. Uh, uh, my name is Landwe Masango and uh, I'm the current chairperson of the board. Let me just deal with the issue about uh, communities in the periphery of the, of the metros. The boundaries of the municipalities by definition are very artificial. The fact of the matter that I support is that there are communities that have always been in the peripheries of the other areas, but functionally they are linked you know, to that municipality. These are people that work 
in that area and actually spend some of those in that area. And it's, it's only fair to then make those people to actually benefit in that area. So we really look at the functionality and naturally in terms as to how the people actually um, you know, you know, work and live, you know, in that area. So it is for that reason that we would always constantly review, in terms as to naturally where do these people actually, you know, belong. That's what the board actually works. It actually works precisely to, to from time to time review these boundaries to reflect the natural, um, um, uh, you know, catchment area of that area. I mean, you, you, you know, of that uh, of that municipality. We clearly are guided by, um, to some extent, functionality, as I said, but we do indeed take into account the views of the committee, and we've always been doing so. We've, we've been doing that, you, you know, since 2011. Okay. And I will continue Mr. to Chairman, do so. Thank you very much indeed. We're going to take a quick break, and then after that, uh, there's a question from the floor about ESCOM charges versus municipal charges for energy. Let's find out what that's about. Stay with us.